coming uh, together today to help celebrate a, an event uh, to uh, commemorate Open Education Week, the first annual, that always sounds so hopeful, but the first annual Open Education Week. But Open Access started um, modestly for the day and became a week that has become a more regularly scheduled uh, event. Obviously. Today we have a, a speaker uh, in the person of uh, Michael McNally, who's a doctor from the and his research interests are broadly speaking, information policy and intellectual property. But he's come to the stage with us today to talk about open education, open education resources. And in the interest of openness and providing access, this presentation is always posted on Source for Western uh, for reading enjoyment and follow up and, and reinforcement of what we here today. So you've been making a presentation and then facilitating the discussion about open education resources. It's nice to see a cross section of folks here from the library that are doing the fact information and media studies. I'll turn it over to Michael to run the show. Very pleased to be here to, uh, to talk about uh, open education and, in, in particular, open educational resources. I, uh, my interest is in alternatives to intellectual property. I'm not so much interested in patents and copyrights, but ways we can get around some of the problems of having uh, having too many patents and copyrights. And I think. Open educational resources are, are one part of that package, uh, particularly in the academic setting. So today we're going to do uh, talk about four things. Uh, cover what are open educational resources and why are they important. Uh, then we're going to look at how to use them, where to find them. Uh, we'll go through a couple of examples. I've got some, uh, some screenshots uh, in the slide presentation. I think we'll go straight to the, the websites. We'll try and do a, a live run through and find some things. Uh, and then we'll, we'll lead into a discussion of copyright and licensing because that's a big issue uh, with respect to use is you need to be sure uh, you're allowed to use the materials in the way you're using them. Uh, and then that finally leads into a discussion of, uh, of how can we create open educational resources. Uh, using them is only one half of the equation. We also want to contribute uh, our work uh, and, and creating is the other side of the use equation. Uh, and of course, there's uh, kind of four goals, uh, and they, they line up uh, roughly with the, the overview. Uh, we want to ensure that people know what OERs are, uh, how to find them, make sure that they have some clarity on the copyright and licensing side, and then uh, and hopefully encourage people to, uh, to create OERs as well. So the openness trend. Uh, there's been a lot of these open initiatives over the past... Uh, about 10 to 15 years. Uh, open source software is probably the most well-known, uh, really the first one to get off the ground, uh, and it's probably the most successful uh, as well. Open access scholarly publishing is, is clearly a clear second in terms of, uh, of recognition and success. Uh, it's made fairly significant inroads. Uh, it's still, uh, still a large number of, uh, of traditional commercial publications. Uh, but there's growing awareness, and, and as awareness of open access has grown, uh, so has its support. Open data is, uh, is one of the newest ones. Uh, this deals with getting data sets largely from uh, federal governments, provincial governments, municipal governments, uh, made available and made available for citizens to use and create uh, data mashups and applications. Uh, open education, which we'll talk about, and open educational resources uh, and then and another one is open innovation. Uh, open innovation I've added here uh, because it's a little bit of a curious one. It, it has that open name. Uh, it's not a very standardized uh, open. You, depending on who you read, it means quite different things. And that's, uh, that's part of the, the term open. It's used quite differently depending on, uh, on what, uh, who's using it and what they're referring to. And in the case of open innovation, there's some authors uh, who like the term open innovation. It's really just strategic use of intellectual property. Uh, so it's not necessarily about, uh, about eliminating barriers. Uh, but generally, these, these open initiatives are about uh, eliminating barriers, facilitating access. Uh, and, and when we're talking about barriers, cost is one. Uh, we're, we're largely aiming at free resources. Uh, and the other barriers are, are use barriers, so the ability to copy and share and modify and reuse. Uh, and so depending on the, the different open initiative and, uh, and how, it's, uh, how it's being practiced, you get various shades of openness. But the, the general trend amongst these open initiatives is to make things more open. 
So looking then at, uh, at open education. Open education is a very broad, uh, a broad concept, a broad initiative. It's much bigger than open educational resources that, that we'll be talking about. Open education is about eliminating barriers to education. Uh, now these are geographic barriers, having more distance learning, uh, making it easier for students in rural and remote areas to study. Uh, it's about eliminating financial barriers, making, uh, making sure the cost isn't a barrier to education. And perhaps most controversially, uh, in some of these open universities, it's about eliminating academic barriers to admission. So, uh, so Athabasca University, which is Canada's open university, uh, the only requirement there to apply is that you're 16 years old. You don't need to uh, have got 82% in your, uh, your last year of high school. You just need to be 16 years old. Uh, and so this is uh, the open education movement is about breaking down these barriers uh, and, and extending the, at least the ability to get into, into higher education to everyone. Um, now, of course, I don't want to get into the questions of accreditation. Uh, there are open universities that, that, that do have different means of trying to accredit students um, who, who kind of self-learn. We're going to talk about open educational resources, uh, which are one part of open education. Uh, they are materials that can help facilitate open education. So the term open educational resources, it can actually be very clearly traced uh, to a 2002 UNESCO conference. Uh, and I don't really like this definition, um, and it's in particular because of this, uh, this catch here about uh, all of edu open educational resources are only for non-commercial purposes, according to UNESCO. Uh, we'll get in when we talk about the, the licensing and copyright issues. I'll talk about that, uh, that term non-commercial a bit more. Um, but the 2002 UNESCO conference was really the starting point. Uh, it itself was a response to an, in, an, initi an initiative by MIT a year earlier. MIT uh, really is kind of the, the leader in this, uh, this field, open educational resources. They went ahead and they took all their course material and they started putting it online. Uh, so this was a 2001 uh, initiative from MIT. You can go to their, uh, well we will go to their, uh, their web page. There's 2,000 courses available uh, and this is syllabi, uh, in some cases, open textbooks, so you get the readings, uh, the exam materials, the lecture slides, you name it. Uh, so this is uh, really about opening up education uh, for individuals. Uh, the OECD, and, and I've, I've probably, this document's a little old, 2007, uh, giving knowledge for free, but I found it's, it's probably the, the best in terms of a, a foundational document. The more recent literature tends to reference it. And it does a very good job of, uh, of really discussing uh, open educational resources in a nuanced, detailed, and, and at times a critical manner. Uh, and I think this is a little bit better of a, of a definition. Digitized materials offered freely and openly for educators, students, and self-learners to use and reuse uh, for teaching, learning, and research. And so it's a fairly broad definition. Uh, open educational resources covers a lot of stuff. Uh, the other term you'll hear a lot of is open courseware. Uh, open courseware is an open educational resource, uh, although there are some open educational resources that are not courseware. Uh, so in one of, the, one of the slides where I talk about uh, various materials, uh, there's a, an, a project, they're recording audio tape of everything that goes on at the US Supreme Court and making it freely available. That's not courseware, uh, but it's clearly an educational resource, so it's something uh, in that case, where it wouldn't fit kind of the more narrow courseware definition, uh, but an educational resource. So these are, open educational resources are primarily at the university level, but you can get uh, all the way down to kindergarten uh, open educational resources. So uh, some sites have, uh, have the full range of everything from graduate level university materials down to kindergarten materials. Uh, so there's a, quite a range. Uh, when we look at uh, what kinds of OER there are, the big focus is on the content, uh, the actual learning objects themselves. But it's important to remember there are also tools uh, for creating OERs, for managing content, and implementation systems. Uh, so these are, are various ways of, uh, of supporting 
uh, open educational resources, and the big one in terms of, uh, of implementation resources is licensing systems. We'll talk about uh, Creative Commons a fair bit. And this content runs the full gambit. Uh, it could be the lecture notes, a slide from a presentation, uh, it could be an exam uh, or a questionnaire or some homework uh, that the students have been provided, the syllabus, uh, and then at the same time it includes all kinds of multimedia content, podcasts, streaming videos, um, anything that could be used for teaching and learning uh, is, is educational content can fit into OER. So it's a very, very broad uh, definition in the content one, which is really where we're going to focus uh, today, is uh, it includes a whole gambit of things. So why? Why should we be interested in OERs? And I'll start with, uh, with the institutional level. Uh, universities are, uh, you know, historically have the academic tradition of the free exchange of information, and that's kind of where the kind of first incentive for OERs come about. Uh, this is, you know, making knowledge freely available is part of that academic tradition. Um, a little bit more strategic, perhaps, uh, is institutions are interested in OERs because they're a way of marketing themselves. They're a way of attracting students. If uh, your materials are freely available uh, and there's a sharp grade 12 student out there who's trying to compare, hey, do I go to, go to Western or do I go to Waterloo? And he can see, oh, look at these courses. I can take not only just some two-paragraph description of the course, I can dig in, I can look at the materials, I can look at the readings, I can look at the assignments. Hey, this course sounds way more interesting, and I can get a real sense of what I'm going to learn here uh, than over at, at, at another institution. So these are a marketing tool. Uh, there's also the, you know, these are taxpayer-funded institutions, and taxpayers should have access to, uh, to the outputs. Uh, so that is another argument being marshaled for open educational resources. Uh, and finally, and I'm, I'm particularly, uh, I believe this is a good argument for OERs, is they do allow collab more collaboration and more innovation, uh, both uh, from the, the scholarly level uh, in terms of individual scholars uh, interacting, collaborating with each other, uh, but also innovation and collaboration on a, uh, on a broader level uh, because these materials are open to all members of society. The barriers... Uh, there's the cost, of course, uh, of, of sustaining, maintaining open educational resources. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this, the, the tension that OER creates with the, uh, the drive towards commercialization. Looking then at the other side, uh, the individuals involved. Uh, why should we create uh, open educational resources? Well, that exact same first motive that the institutions had. I mean, this is the academic tradition of of free exchange, we want to do something that's good. Um, you know, giving knowledge away for free is, is an inherently good thing to do. Um, again, much like the universities can use OERs to, uh, to market themselves, as, a, as an academic, as a scholar, you can use OERs to enhance your own reputation. Uh, you can get your material out there to a broader community uh, and perhaps uh, help establish your, your name. Uh, and in many cases, uh, you know, it's not that difficult to take material you're already producing for your own teaching for your own students and to transform it into something that can be made accessible for everyone. So, uh, you know, I've, you now I had a little bit of advantage because the copyright and the licensing side of things aren't as complex for me, but I've, you know, in, in making this slideshow, I wanted to make something that itself was an open educational resource, and I found it wasn't that much more difficult. It took a little bit of extra work. There's a, a slide at the end that deals with copyright and licensing issues. Um, but you know, generally, if you're already making a, a learning resource or a teaching resource, it's not that difficult to just make it broadly available. Uh, the barriers for creating them are the lack of recognition, uh, the lack of support. Um, you, you can create OERs all you want, um, but if you're not getting any recognition in a promotion or a, promotion or a tenure committee, uh, it, it really disincentivizes putting in the extra effort. Uh, we'll talk, when we talk about licensing, uh, about how to retain some control over one's intellectual work. Uh, you don't have to, in creating an OER, uh, forfeit all control over what gets done with it. Um, you know, one 
particular one is is uh, is fear from the broader community. It's uh, you know it's one thing to create uh, you know a, a course and have to deal with some criticism from the students involved. Uh, it's another thing to put that whole course up there for the whole world to see, invite feedback, and get it from perhaps your your scholarly peers who don't think it's up to snuff, or uh, you know members uh, members of the broader public who may take any range of issue with it. And, uh, and finally, uh, copyright and licensing issues, uh, which hopefully in, in this case we'll clarify that today. And then, uh, well, why should we use OERs? Well, it's easy, it's free, uh, you can get some excellent material. Uh, it does take a little work to familiarize yourself with how to find them, where to find them. Uh, but you know, generally we're talking about getting some excellent co content uh, fairly easily uh, that in many cases but not all, you can use and modify uh, for your own use. Uh, allows you to bring in new perspectives. You can hear other voices. Uh, you can see the way different people are teaching the same subject you are teaching. Um, and you can say, oh, well, this, you know, here's an open course in uh, you know, magnetism at, uh, at MIT. This is how they you know, structured their assignments. Well, I like this. I'll incorporate this, this approach. Maybe I'll even incorporate this assignment. Um, and of course, you know, supporting OERs, using OERs, uh, you know, helps support the, the open movement itself. Um, what are the, the barriers? Concerns over the quality. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about uh, how to find good stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, of course, it's key to get stuff that you can use and that's, uh, that's high quality. Um, and again, uh, this is not the type of thing, OERs, you simply can't uh, 15 minutes before a lecture, say you've uh, had a bad day and aren't prepared, go find someone else's lecture that quickly uh, and, and take it from another institution and hope to plop it in seamlessly. You do have to uh, do a little bit of time searching uh, and you do have to put in the effort to make sure uh, that if you're going to use material from others, um, hopefully you're gonna, you're gonna take it and, uh, and, uh, and scrutinize it a little bit. Uh, and again, the same, uh, same copyright and licensing issues uh, that, that come up in creation also come up in use. So I mentioned uh, this tension between commercialization and the public good. And, and at the broadest level, uh, you know, OERs from a societal perspective are beneficial because they promote lifelong learning and they extend the opportunity to education uh, to non-traditional students. That's both uh, you know, here in the community, here in the country, and, uh, and internationally as well. On the flip side, though, uh, you have increasing emphasis on commercialization of university research. Uh, increasingly, universities, our federal government, are looking at how can we create dollars and cents corporations' jobs out of university research. Uh, and giving knowledge away for free doesn't seem to fit in that equation as easily. Uh, and of course, this, this can not just an institutional thing, it can affect you at a personal level. Uh, depending on your, your subject matter or discipline, you may actually, um, you know, in, in specifically in the, uh, the natural sciences, you might lose your own ability to patent your own research by, uh, by freely distributing uh, lecture materials uh, in advance. Uh, now that's a fairly, uh, fairly narrow concern, but I'm interested uh, in, in what you have to think as, uh, as, as scholars and academics, uh, potential users and creators. Uh, how do we balance on one hand uh, the increasing interest in commercialization? Uh, and, and you know, commercialization does mean employment and jobs, uh, so it's, it's not just money for some faceless corporation um, with this kind of trend towards openness. Um, now, how do we balance our desires to, to make knowledge available um, with our kind of institutional desires to, uh, to create some, uh, some economic spin-offs of our work? Yes, yes. I'd,
Well, if 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 we're interested in in innovation, um, you know, what what's the better incentive for for innovation? Is the the commercial dollar uh, going to drive going to drive better and higher quality innovation, uh, or does perhaps uh, making things freely available uh, do a better job? I think that's a it's a key a key point is that there is a, a disciplinary divide here um, between between particularly the humanities where much of the research doesn't have an immediate uh, commercial uh, commercial value and perhaps uh, engineering uh, on the other side where uh, research tends to be most commercially valuable. Uh, any other thoughts on this kind of tension between the uh, the commercialization and uh, and the making research freely available? But one other one other thing to think about is uh, you know often it's uh, it's portrayed as this this rather simple dichotomy of, uh, of make things open uh, and free and the public good or commercialize and private profit, uh, but it is much more complex than that. Uh, in many cases, when we make research freely available, uh, the, the people who are best able uh, to take advantage of that are well-funded uh, researchers and corporations who have their, uh, their eye on the ball and say, hey, now I've got academics pumping out research for free, uh, and I can take this and, uh, and, and be the ones who ultimately commercialize it. And on the flip side, I mean, commercialized uh, research uh, in many cases, does lead to you know, important imp improvements in human health and well-being. So, uh, you know, it's, although I have framed it uh, as a rather simple dichotomy, it's important to remember that it's uh, it's much more complex. So then, looking at how do we use OERs, uh, and there's kind of three three big questions. Where do I find them? Uh, that's the obvious one. Uh, how do I determine if they're any good? And uh, and how do I figure out what I can do with it? Uh, and fortunately, the where to find them question largely takes care of the other two. So if you're, uh, you know, interested in finding some some open courseware, uh, the fact is that the the schools that have been making their courses open tend to be the the most reputable universities. It's not uh, your kind of minor third tier schools who have embraced open education. It's your MITs. Uh, your Yale has a big uh, open university initiative. Uh, Michigan, uh, very big in the states uh, in particular, a number of, of very prominent universities in the US have, uh, have really put their content out there. Uh, so you know that when you're going to MIT's open courseware site that there's at least a little bit of, of name and brand recognition there. Of course, you're, you're gonna have to go through it yourself and make the final assessment. Um, and on the other side, you know, how do I determine what I can do with that? Uh, depending on, you know, whether you're using a, a broader search engine, uh, they usually tell you fairly quickly what you can do. Uh, you can even, we'll have a look at OER Commons next. It, uh, it specifically uh, has four little classes of, of content in terms of what you're allowed to do, and it comes right up. So it's very clear uh, as you're searching or as you're browsing what kind of uh, use and modification you're allowed. So. Uh, the where to locate question largely uh, helps address the other two. So I've included uh, lots of links here. Uh, this is meant, uh, again, as to, to be a resource uh, so that you can come back to, uh, to this slide and the next one. Uh, we'll go through three of them. Uh, so we're going to look at, at OER Commons. The Open Courseware Consortium is, uh, is a big consortium of many of the universities participating. I think it's got about 6,600 courses uh, in the consortium. So, uh, you know, lots of content there. Um, you know, if you're 
looking for uh, an idea of perhaps how to, you know, what other educators are doing in your field, uh, likely going to have a course uh, somewhat similar to what you teach. Uh, OER Commons, we'll have a look at. It's got uh, over 30,000 uh, different resources in it. Uh, and it's got more than just course material. It's got some, uh, some multimedia content as well. Uh, the next uh, national repository of online courses, the World Lecture Hall, are, are another pair of places you can go. Uh, Google and iTunes are uh, not unsurprisingly, they're interested in this stuff. Uh, so there's the you know, Google search engine for open courseware or open educational resources and iTunes University uh, where you can, you can go to, uh, to either of these sites and, uh, and find open education resources and they try and scour as far afield um, and find things. Number of national initiatives. Uh, these are, are kind of just here for reference more than anything else. China, France, Japan, Ireland. Uh, these aren't the only initiatives, but they're uh, some of the most advanced and most prominent ones. Uh, there isn't a, a major Canadian initiative. Uh, and in fact, on the next slide, I've got this is a, a sample of some of the, the larger US universities uh, with OpenCourseWare. There's not a really stellar Canadian example. Uh, Capilano University, Athabasca University have some stuff, but it's, it's relatively minor. Uh, there's no real Canadian leadership uh, in this field, except when I get to the, the references and resources at the end, there is a, a group out of uh, Vancouver, the Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, they've made some excellent guides on open educational resources. So uh, there is a small little bit of Canadian uh, open educational resource as excellence, but generally, uh, it's, you know, in particular, it's U.S. institutions that have made, uh, made the most uh, advances. And I'll point out, uh, in particular, Connections by Rice University. Uh, Connections is not just uh, a bunch of content. It's actually a system for creating content as well. Uh, so you can go and not only see what Connections has, but you can also, uh, through Connections, you can contribute uh, material. Uh, but again, uh, we'll look at, uh, at the OER Commons when we talk a little bit about creation as well. You can contribute your content there as well. A uh, number of multimedia uh, resources. There's several on the handout as well. Uh, we'll look at, uh, at Merlot in particular. Uh, this is really perhaps some of the most interesting ones. It's, it's one thing to look at someone else's course, uh, but perhaps you're interested in a sound, a video, an image. Where can you get something uh, that isn't, uh, that's licensed on a more open term, that isn't encumbered by, uh, by copyright? Uh, and then discipline-specific ones. So I mentioned this uh, OYEZ project. It's, uh, it's audio material of the U.S. Supreme Court. And this is, again, not, uh, not courseware, uh, but something that could be used in education. Uh, John Hopkins uh, School of Public Health, uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, has a lot of uh, discipline-specific materials. Uh, Harvard has, uh, has six kind of areas in which they've made materials open, but they're not, uh, not an open courseware initiative comparable to, uh, to say, Michigan or Tufts or, uh, or MIT. So looking then at, uh, at OER Commons, I've got, I think we'll, we'll go from here over to the website. Uh, so it's you know, 30,000 resources all over. Comes with four types of licensing. Uh, the no strings attached, which is fairly obvious. You can do what you want. Remix and share allows you to, uh, to both share the content and modify it, share only, uh, and read the fine print. Uh, so when you actually, there's more specific conditions on use. Uh, it's very easy to use. And uh, so we'll have a look at the website here. And uh, you can easily you can search or you can browse. Um, and the, the best part about this website is the, uh, the menus it lets you drill down in. So you can you start with uh, you know, a subject level. You'll notice science and technology has about half of the, uh, the resources. So um, and depending on what you're looking for, a search in this area isn't going to turn or is going to turn up a ton of stuff. But you can see over on this menu here, uh, you can limit by subject area, 
you can limit by grade level, so you can, uh, you can get rid of those K through 12 materials. Uh, you can look at what kind of material do you want. Uh, do you want an audio lecture? Are you looking for a syllabus? Are you looking for uh, homework, lecturenums? Uh, this is really useful because uh, if you have a specific type of, of media in mind, you want a lecture note or you want a, a video, you can come down here and eliminate all the things you don't want and, and look specifically either browsing or searching for a specific type of content. Uh, and again, with the media formats as well, you can find audio graphic formats, uh, content for mobile, mobile phones, uh, web content, video, interactive material. So it's, these drop-down menus uh, are extremely useful for allowing you to, uh, to find things uh, that specifically suit. And the last one, of course, the conditions of use. So uh, if you want something that you can, you can modify, you can get rid of the share only and the, uh, the read the fine print ones. Uh, and in fact, if you don't want to bother reading any licenses at all, you can just always get rid of the, uh, the read the fine print ones. Looking over here, uh, it gives you a, I don't know, a description, title of the material, uh, subject area, where it's, uh, what level it's at, uh, the connection. So this is OER Commons has pulled material from uh, connections. It's the Rice University. There's MIT, OpenCourseWare. Uh, you can get uh, all kinds of different institutional uh, repositories can be searched or browsed through here. And then right over here, it's got the, uh, the license. They've each got their own icon. These are specific to, uh, to OER Commons, so you can have a kind of quick idea of, of the licensing. Um, and again, the search, the search works uh, much the same in brow as browsing. So if you were interested in something on multiple regression, So multiple regression, a little bit more specific. You only get nine results out of the uh, 30,000. Uh, but again, you can go in. Um, you can narrow by format, uh, media type, conditions of use. Um, I'll open up this, uh, this example here. So this is uh, from John Hopkins School of Public Health Open Courseware Collection. Uh, it's got further uh, specific uh, information on the material here. We'll have a look at the various Creative Commons licensing uh, conditions in a bit, but as you can see, the, the license type, uh, you know, media formats, graphics formats, uh, graphics, HTML, uh, and then again, you just click, and it'll take you over. This is now the, the John Hopkins uh, Open Courseware site. Uh, you can go into the lecture materials, and I think it's about lecture eight multiple logistic regression, uh, three PDFs of the slides, and three MP3s uh, recording, audio recordings of a lecture. So uh, you know, if you want to see how they're teaching uh, multiple regression at John Hopkins, uh, it's free for you to, uh, to go in and have a look. And you can also, I mean, there's the syllabus, the schedule, the readings, the assignments. Uh, so that's just one example um, of, of kind of going through from OER Commons. Any questions about uh, about OER Commons? Okay. Well, I've I've dug through several of these kind of the larger uh, general repositories directories. I found this one OER Commons, although it does have a whole bunch of uh, primary and secondary material. Uh, it was the, those drop down menus were quite useful in uh, in narrowing things because uh, depending on what you're looking at. Uh, you can get thousands of results, or you can get a very, I mean, in the case of multiple regression, we were able to get just nine results. Uh, but some broader searches turn up thousands of things. Uh, and then drilling down to specific content uh, and licensing terms can be quite useful. So looking alternatively, this is uh, MIT's OpenCourseWare uh, website. So I mean, it's this, uh, the one that started it all, MIT is a you know, big name, reputable school. Um, I found searching this website was terrible. Uh, that just as a, my own personal experience, I had a really hard time uh, getting, getting good results searching. I, I, I got a lot of results, um, but then was having a hard time. The search options were, weren't as granular 
uh, and I wasn't able to uh, to create as what as, as solid searches. But the uh, you know, the viewing all 2,000 courses uh, so it brings up courses by department, and and this is the most useful stuff down here. Is it's got a list of icons, and you can go through. Uh, each course, and these icons tell you what, what you're getting. So you can get you know, lecture notes, assignments, exams, and other materials. So this is, a, you know, I found this you know, questions, tests, uh, assignments uh, category is particularly useful. You, know, you don't want to recycle the, uh, the same stuff all the time. You have, a look, uh, have a look at a similar course, maybe get another idea of a different type of assignment or a, uh, you know, a specific question. Um, and of course, you know, there's even the uh, Sloan School of Management, one of the top uh, top business schools, not to uh, take anything away from Ivy, but their uh, Sloan School of Management has materials, so it's the whole whole gambit. Um, I'll jump to the physics department, and it's, I scrolled through. Uh, the physics department has probably the largest uh, selection of materials, so you can see uh, the little icons again, and they'll you scroll over them, they'll tell you what's available. Uh, and you can go in. So I had, uh, had a look here at Physics 2. Uh, for those of you who can't read this, this is Electricity and Magnetism with an Experimental Focus. Uh, so you go in, and over here you've got syllabus, lecture notes, labs, assignments, exams. One click, you can get it all, uh, which, is, uh, which is particularly useful. One thing I found with the MIT stuff, sometimes they're using open textbooks, and so you, you go look at an assignment, and it says, do question 28 on page 473 of the textbook. Uh, so if you just pull up the assignment on its own, it's of no use to you, because you need the corresponding material. Uh, so this you know, getting everything at once is quite useful. And that's, I think, you know, other than searching, the other uh, issue with the MIT is uh, you really need to take the course as a package. Uh, sometimes you can't just extract single elements out of it. Uh, but look, if you go to the exams here, you can get uh, get the quizzes and the solutions, even the practice quizzes. So you can uh, hope this opens up quickly. But you can you can have a you know get a, yeah, here it comes. So you can get exactly what they were doing in quiz number one. Um, I'm not an electricity or magnetism person, but uh, you can see right here the assignment, and then uh, again they had the solutions are there as well. So you can, uh, you know, you're stuck or you're uh, you're interested in uh, in trying to experiment with something new, or you're interested in testing yourself in electricity and magnetism. You could be a, a lifelong learner. Uh, this stuff's all here, uh, and so you can you can go in. Many of the other institutional repositories are, are quite similar. There are uh, whole courses, and you can, uh, you can dig up all parts of the course, from the syllabus, uh, the lecture notes, uh, the exam materials. Uh, if they're using open textbooks, uh, you can get the open textbooks as well. So uh, you know, this is when you're interested in a very specific topic or, or to see what, uh, what someone in a similar situation is doing. This is a pretty good way of, uh, of going through and finding something specific. And lastly, we'll have a look at, uh, at, at Merlot. So Merlot is a big multimedia site. Um, and one of the benefits of Merlot is that it is, uh, many of its resources are peer reviewed, not all. Uh, and so that does address some of the concerns regarding quality. You can, uh, you can look for materials that have been peer reviewed. Uh, there's also user reviews as well, so you can see, uh, you can find materials that others have found useful. Uh, and again, most of the time, this is, uh, you know, the, the users are either people who have, are educators and they found this useful for teaching, or the other important opinion is people who are learners and who have found this, hey, this is a good resource as well. Uh, so what I like about uh, Merlot in particular is it's, uh, it's got a very advanced search function. Um, so you can, much like OER Commons, you can drill down by uh, the, the type of material you're looking for. Uh, it specifically allows you to look by technical format. We'll talk about formatting uh, of OERs on the creation side. Uh, again, audience. So you can, uh, you can filter out some of the, uh, the content that you don't want. 
uh, even look for content for your BlackBerry or your iPad in particular. Um, and again, down here, let you uh, look by license as well. So you can find materials that are uh, free for you to, to modify, use and modify. Um, in terms of browsing, uh, it works well. It's not quite, uh, quite as granular as, uh, as the OER Commons was. But you can, uh, again, you can start by discipline. Uh, if you go into, again, science and technology, uh, tends to be the leader in terms of, uh, of open educational resources. So they have 12,000 uh, resources, but you can go in, uh, you can go physics, you're down to 2,000, and, uh, and then from there you can go specifically to you know, classical mechanics. Now you're only looking at 350 material, or 340 materials, and then again, by material type, you can start to get, uh, get a fairly granular uh, look. So there's only... 24 open courses uh, in, in Merlot on classical mechanics. Um, so let's, I'll, I'll show you what a, what a record looks like here, but I want to go back. Um, look at humanities. Uh, and you see, see some of the disciplines, uh, Chicano and Latino studies, only has five materials. Uh, and this is something to think about uh, when, when we talk about creation. Is there are a lot of gaps. Uh, and there are a lot of places where you can contribute. Uh, so communication studies has uh, just 31 materials. Uh, you can go down here. Uh, so this fair use of copyrighted material, we'll have, we'll have a look at, uh, at it. You can go, pulls up the record, uh, gives you a, a little bit of a description. This is actually a particularly neat, uh, neat video. What they've done is uh, taken Disney films, uh, splice them all apart to make a critique about copyright and, uh, and a discussion of fair use. Uh, so this is a video. You can, uh, you can see the terms of licensing. Um, so perhaps if you're in a communications class, uh, wanted something to engage the students, uh, because copyright does not tend to be the most engaging student or en engaging topic, particularly for, uh, for undergraduate students, this, uh, this video is an excellent uh, an excellent uh, choice. So you can, uh, you can drill down and find specific content. Uh, and again, because it's multimedia, uh, this is perhaps one area uh, that's of particular interest. So those are uh, Merlot, the OER Commons, uh, and the MIT Courseware are, uh, are three examples. Uh, again, I've got uh, just, I'll run through. These slides are essentially uh, the same thing I've already talked about. Uh, in making this open educational resource, my discussion and live run through of the sites wouldn't be there. Uh, so I had to put in the, uh, the screenshots as well. Uh, but, uh, but all this information is there uh, for your reference if you want to go on to, uh, to scholarship at Western. So this brings us to copyright and licensing issues. Uh, copyright is, is a barrier to OERs, not just in terms of creating them, but also in terms of using them. Uh, copyright gives the creators of artistic works a considerable deal of control, including the ability to copy and publish uh, and modify works. Uh, and so this, this comes up in terms of both uh, creation and use. Um, and, and when we're creating things, it's important to think about uh, you know, not just the, the content that we've originally authored, but the, the use of other people's materials. So even in this presentation, I've used those screenshots from Merlot and, uh, and the OER Commons and uh, MIT, and even the logo for Open Course Week. That's not my intellectual property. Uh, I don't have the right to go around copying it and publishing it. Uh, so if I want to make material broadly available, I have to, uh, to figure out how to solve that problem. So copyright uh, is the kind of standard rule. Uh, if you're making notes right now, you've got the copyright on those notes. They're uh, an original, artistic, creative, literary, dramatic work in a fixed format. Uh, you have the copyright on them for the rest of your life. And in Canada, your heirs will get the copyright on them for another 50 years. Uh, so this is, it's an automatic process. You don't have to put a symbol, you don't have to mail yourself an envelope with the, 
description of what you've done. You don't even have to write copyright. Uh, it's automatic. And this is important because when you're creating uh, works, when you're creating material, creating lecture slides, for example, you've got the copyright on them. And it's automatic. You don't have to do anything. Uh, but if you want others to be able to use uh, and modify your material, that means you've got to take some additional steps. Uh, the Copyright Act has a long list of very specific uh, things the copyright owner is allowed to do. They're exclusive rights. They're things that only the copyright owner can do. Uh, it's not just copy, it's publish, it's telecommunicate to the public. Uh, the most important one, though, is authorize. Um, as the copyright owner, you can, uh, you can authorize others to, uh, to do different things with your work. And it's that ability to authorize when you combine with a licensing scheme that can take a work that's closed, a copyrighted work, and make it open. Uh, there are exceptions. Uh, fair dealing in Canada, fair use in the United States. There are specific educational exemptions. Big debates uh, in Parliament on the current copyright bill as to whether they'll add education to fair dealing. Uh, that would be a, a very useful uh, a boon for educators, a boon for education. Uh, but that doesn't just mean that you can go taking uh, anyone's intellectual content and passing it off saying, well, I made an open educational resource, therefore it's fair dealing under the education, uh, uh, under the education claw, our part. Uh, there's still specific conditions that need to be met. The, uh, you have to go to the Supreme Court, essentially, to look at them. Uh, so there are exceptions, but these are not exceptions that allow us to share other people's intellectual work with, uh, with freely, uh, without any restrictions. Uh, and again, copyright term does expire, uh, so you can get materials that no longer are protected by copyright. The thing is, it's a long time. Uh, these slides... Uh, for the sake of easy math, assume I live another 50 years. Uh, these slides will only become uh, free of copyright in 2112. Uh, in Mexico, that'll be, Mexico has a much longer copyright term, 2162. Uh, there is this life of the author plus 100 years. The U.S. is uh, life of the author plus 70. Uh, so if you want to wait for things to come into the public domain, maybe if you're doing history, you don't have much of a problem. Um, or, or English literature, you can get a lot of great resources, uh, have no copyright on them. But if you're doing anything kind of current, and if current means the past uh, 50 plus years, uh, works are going to tend to be copyrighted. The flip side of it is the public domain. Uh, so what's in the public domain? Material where the copyright terms expired, material where there is no copyright protection available, and material where the copyright has been forfeited. Uh, so Dickens, Tolstoy, Shakespeare, they're all old enough now at this point. They've been dead for long enough. Their material's in the public domain. Uh, some things just aren't copyrightable. Facts and ideas, the fact that it's 11 degrees and sunny today is not copyrightable. Uh, but the presentation of that may be. So you know, if I make a nice box with the sun and 11 degrees and maybe a few days weather forecast, I can get the copyright for that actual presentation of it, although I don't own the, uh, the fact that it's 11 degrees. Uh, and then some things uh, people decide not to copyright. The U.S. government does not claim copyright on anything it produces, and in fact that's a great source of open educational materials, is uh, not everything that ends in a .gov address is free of copyright, but uh, much of what's on a .gov website, because those are all U.S. government websites, are uh, free of copyright. Uh, again, you can't just go taking everything because some things there are other people's intellectual property that the U.S. government is putting up. Uh, but that is a, a one place to look for uh, open educational resources. The catch of the public domain, it's great to use from because there's no conditions, no restrictions. Uh, as a creator, as an author, if you want to put your work there, uh, you have to be prepared to let anything and everything happen to it. You have no control if you forfeit uh, your work to the public domain, which involves actually making a statement to do so. Again, copyright is a default rule, so if you've got uh, the notes you're writing there, you'd have to actually write or mark them to the effect that I surrender the copyright on these uh, to, to have them enter the public domain uh, you know, 
without waiting 50 years after your death, for example. So the in-between is licensing. Uh, this allows uh, individuals to retain some of their rights, uh, but allow more uses. And, uh, and Creative Commons is the biggest one. Uh, we'll go through the Creative Commons system. It's the overwhelmingly uh, dominant system in open educational resources. There are alternatives. I've got the, uh, the new free documentation license. Uh, but it seems to be that, uh, that everything is moving towards Creative Commons. And, and this is actually uh, largely a good thing because if there are a lot of different licensing systems out there, you get into uh, a problem where it's difficult to incorporate materials where you have strongly different licensing conditions. So the Creative Commons approach, although there are different licenses available from Creative Commons, it's fairly simple to figure out how to incorporate uh, and how different Creative Commons licenses interact. When you start mixing other types of licensing schemes, that you really start to get into that legal analysis of, okay, this is, uh, I could do this under this license, but can I mix that with something that's licensed differently? Uh, Creative Commons has three layers. Uh, the legal code, there's a, a very legal, technical uh, code that you can go, you can look at the website. It's the legal document. Uh, there's a, a data side, a machine-readable code that um, you can mark documents so that in the metadata they will be, uh, be identified as, uh, as Creative Commonly licensed. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the, uh, in the creation side. And finally, most important, is the simple, easy to read human code. Uh, there are six different types of licenses and they all have little symbols and it's fairly easy uh, to understand what they mean. So, kind of baseline rules in all licenses. Uh, they're irrevocable, they're worldwide. Uh, they don't in any way take away from your fair dealing or your educational exceptions. They're additive in terms of what you get to do. Uh, all users, uh, when you create a Commons license something, get the ability to uh, copy, distribute, display. I'm not entirely sure what digitally perform means. Uh, but, you know, your standard uh, copy, distribute, uh, and display privileges. Uh, again, you have to license a work when, you're, when you use Creative Commons, and those licensing statements need to stay with the work. Uh, so I'll show you the very end slide uh, of my presentation, which deals with some of the, how did I license those screenshots I had? Uh, how do I use other people's content that's Creative Commonly licensed? Uh, and attribution must always be given to the author. Uh, there is actually a, a Creative Commons zero license, a surrender to the public domain, which is, which is a way of marking uh, that you're, you've surrendered your work to the public domain. Uh, but it's not as common as the six other licenses. So there's uh, kind of three different options you can choose in addition to attribution. Uh, Non-commercial, uh, which is a terrible mess. Uh, it's not entirely clear what this means. Creative Commons isn't entirely clear what it means. Uh, you know, it, it's pretty clear that you can't, if something is non-commercially licensed, you can't use it in a for-profit setting with, with immediate remuneration. So if I was charging everyone here uh, entry fee to, to listen to this, uh, I would be violating non-commercial licenses. So I've used, uh, used some content that's, that's got a non-commercial clause in it, MIT's webpage. Uh, has a non-commercial clause in it. I can't charge people uh, in a setting then and, and directly profit. But even the MIT page, you go to it uh, and they say, we're not, you know, here's some general guidelines on what non-commercial means to us. But uh, they still say that in a, a for-profit business could use their material in a training setting, for example, because that would be non-commercial in nature. So this, this non-commercial one is a, is a a little bit of a problem. It's not entirely clear. Uh, but you do have the ability uh, as a creator to say, I'm going to take a Creative Commons non-commercial license. I don't want people profiting uh, from my intellectual work. Uh, and, and generally, uh, you should, that there's a f an understanding of what non-commercial means. What it exactly means is a, is a little bit in doubt. Uh, the other two, uh, no derivatives means that uh, you know, people can't take your work and build a derivative off of it. So 
I've created this slideshow. If I were to put a, a non-derivative clause into my Creative Commons licensing, it means that you can go take it and add a few extra slides and, and then represent it yourself. You'd have to kind of take it as is. Uh, and this is the other word you hear a lot is remixing. There is remixing allowed. So uh, the no derivatives kind of prevents remixing. Uh, and then share alike uh, is in many ways the opposite of no derivatives. The sh under the share alike condition, you're allowed to make derivative works, but the catch is those subsequent works must carry the same licensing condition. So you can, uh, you can combine these various uh, NC, ND, and SA approaches into to six licenses. I've got them on the, the next slide. But these two, uh, share alike and non-derivatives, are incompatible because one allows derivatives and one specifically excludes them. Uh, the basic license is attribution. Got to credit the, uh, credit the uh, original source. Uh, attribution and share alike, you can make derivative works. Uh, you can do whatever you please, but uh, the source has to be uh, acknowledged and any derivative has to have that same license. Uh, attribution, no derivatives is, uh, you can do what you want, but you have, must uh, identify the original source, but you can't, uh, you can copy, but you can't alter it. Uh, Non-commercial is, uh, is where you can try and restrict commercial usages. Uh, and then the, the two most complex are attribution, attribution non-commercial share alike. Uh, this is what MIT's open courseware portal is produced under. Uh, you need to, uh, when you use screenshots of MIT's open courseware or the content itself, uh, it can't be commercial in nature. You have to uh, credit the original source. Um, and you've got to, uh, got to use a, a similar license if you're, uh, in terms of, not the website, but the, the content should come under a similar license. And attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives is the most restrictive license. Uh, it basically allows copying only. So using these, uh, these licensing systems, we can, uh, we can then create OER. And why, uh, why should we create them? Well, the, the best reason is there's gaps. Uh, you know, much, much like uh, you know, we all have our, our individual expertise in, uh, in research and learning and teaching, we can, and uh, if we want to, create our own, uh, our own OERs and share them and, uh, and help fill in those gaps. Uh, it's, you can start small. Uh, you can take something like a guest lecture or a, or a presentation or even just a course uh, syllabus and, uh, and start from there. It is, you know, to, to take a whole course uh, and make it open is a lot of work. Uh, and depending on your department or your setting, you may alienate some of your colleagues too, uh, if, depending on how much ownership they feel over a course. Uh, they're best developed collaboratively. Ask for feedback. Uh, and not just from peers, from the people who are learning. Um, so, you, you know, feedback from students, uh, you know, solicit feedback in, in an open educational resource. Uh, put something on the end that says, you know, if you've got any comments or anything, send, send me an email. Um, you may want to add, I'm not going to guarantee I'll reply to you, but, uh, but at least this way, you, you know, someone may say, hey, I, I looked at your electricity and magnetism course, and I found the, the, the tests and solutions you had were excellent, uh, but I found lecture number four was really hard to understand. And it could be, uh, you know, this could be a, a student at another university. This could be a, uh, a retired person halfway across the world who's just a, a learner. But at least you get, uh, get some feedback and you can improve. Um, the big one is institutional support. So, uh, you know, where can we put these things? Um, you can, you can contribute to OER Commons yourself. Uh, you don't need the institutional support on that side. Uh, but when your institution, you know, if, if Western were to say we're launching an open courseware initiative, uh, that would be a big, uh, a big push factor. The other side of that is get some recognition for, uh, for open, course, uh, open courseware and open educational resources as well. Say, you know, hey, if I'm going to... Uh, going to make these materials available, uh, you know, promote lifelong learning, uh, pr help promote the university, uh, you know, maybe I should have some recognition of that uh, because it is 
there is a little bit of work involved. It's not as simple as, uh, as simply taking what you've done for a classroom and immediately flipping it over um, as, a, as an open educational resources. And then finally, uh, you've got to be mindful of, of IP. Another one is privacy as well. Uh, depending on what you're doing, um, you may start implicating the, uh, the privacy of, of students, particularly if you're in a classroom. Uh, setting. So you, have, you do need to be mindful uh, of those two factors. Uh, you know, the two biggest things you control as an OER creator are the, uh, the license and the format. And, uh, and you can really, the idea here is the license and the format should work together. Uh, so surrender to the public domain where you give up all control. Uh, the CC BY and the CC uh, attribution or CC BY share alike license grant users the most ability. They allow people to modify your work. Uh, now, if you're going to let people modify your work, make it in a format that it's easier to do so. Uh, a PDF uh, is a harder document to work with. That being said, uh, you can cut a PDF up. It, it may have the, the text may be highlightable. You can take screenshots of it if there's graphics and then uh, copy them out that way. Uh, but, you know, kind of logically, a uh, file format, an open, editable file format is better if you're going to license people to, uh, to modify your work. Uh, and, of course, it's important to remember, you know, it doesn't matter which file format you choose. If someone wants to edit something, uh, they're going to be able to do it on a technical level. Uh, the legal, the licensing is where you really have the control to, uh, to restrict uh, the kind of remixing and modification. Uh, other considerations, uh, proprietary file formats, and then particularly newest versions of Office. Um, well, most people here, uh, it's no problem for, for them. Uh, you never know if you're creating an open educational resource, who's going to use it. Uh, might, be, might be that retired person in, uh, in, in rural Saskatchewan where you know, maybe broadband is an issue. Uh, a high definition streaming video is not going to be the, uh, the best open educational resource for them. Maybe they don't have the newest up to date software. Uh, it could be someone, uh, you know, in OERs, uh, there's a big international push to have them used in, uh, in Africa in particular. So, uh, you know, you need to be mindful that the end users could be anyone. Uh, so the the more open the file format, uh, the more editable it is, uh, is, is generally preferred. Hyperlinks. Uh, so throughout this presentation, I've kind of you know, hyperlinked the text. And that's, uh, that's great. Uh, it's more useful than just listing the name of a website and forcing someone to find the website on their own. Uh, but an, an embedded link uh, is best when you have the, the website next to it. So if you go all the way back when I listed the, the two pages of, of OER resources, in that case, I took the time to say, this is the name of the resource, and here's the hyperlink you can click on with the URL in full spelled out form. Because in some places, they may be printing these resources. Uh, and, a, and a hyperlink is not going to come out in the print. Uh, so you need to be mindful of things like that. Uh, again, students with perceptual difficulties uh, may be uh, using these resources, so uh, you know, sharp color contrast, large and clear fonts, uh, audio captions, uh, captions for audio and video material. Um, again, depending on, uh, on what you're doing, this could be a lot of time. Uh, if you record uh, a whole 13 weeks of a three-hour lecture uh, and then decide you want to make it open, that's a lot of uh, captioning you want to you'd have to go put in afterwards, but uh, it is something to be mindful of. Uh, so I was, uh, in, I think it's the multiple regression or central limit theorem. I was looking for examples in OER Commons. I pulled some material from Connections at Rice, and sure enough, they're, they have closed captioning on the, uh, on the video. Um, so you know, some institutions are really uh, going kind of all out in terms of making their resources accessible. The only thing is the video looked like it was recorded in the 1980s, so uh, I'm not entirely sure with that. And that's, sometimes you do pull up things that are quite old. Uh, some open educational resources 
are, uh, are in fact from the 80s, so uh, something to be mindful of. And, and last, uh, lastly, you know, when, you, when you localize, uh, when you have local references, slang, new words, um, of course these don't translate as well uh, across <coughs> languages and cultures. So uh, depending on what you're doing, uh, and depending on how broadly you're thinking your audience is, uh, you may want to take that into consideration. So how, how, do, you, how do you get these out there? Uh, and now see, I've gone back to just putting the links into uh, in embedded links. So institutional repositories, something like scholarship at Western. Uh, you know, it's uh, make the material available. Uh, of course, you, you need to have uh, you know, a license at the beginning. Uh, to, to indicate uh, open open repository. So OER Commons, uh, right on their front page, they've got a button contribute. You can go in uh, and you can uh, you can put your material up there. So that's uh, that's the next thing I'm going to do with this presentation. I put it up on scholarship at Western. Uh, I'm going to see what the OER Commons uh, site is like. Uh, connections, which is the big the big thing out of Rice University. It's a whole suite. Uh, it hosts OERs. You can create OERs there. Uh, I got looking through it a little bit. Uh, and I, I mean, it seems to be quite an elaborate tool and allow you to do a lot. Uh, but it does seem to think you need to invest some time and, uh, and effort in, into learning the system. Uh, and, and last one is, uh, is social networking sites. Uh, you know, even YouTube, you can license your content uh, under a Creative Commons license, put it up on YouTube, put it up on Flickr. Uh, and in fact, you may be more likely to be found there than anywhere else. Um, so you know, there are lots of different ways uh, to, to get your comment or content out there. Um, Creative Commons has, has very clear uh, guides on their website about how to mark your own work and how to attribute other people's work. So I'll have a look at my last slide where I do some of the attribution. And, uh, and even Microsoft, uh, you could download a plugin. Uh, I did that for this presentation. You download a plugin and it'll take you through the steps. You can make your work public domain, you can make your work Creative Commons license. Uh, and, and the nice thing about that is it does that, that machine readable code. Uh, for you. So now when I put this up, it's put up on Scholarship of Western, when I put it up on the OER Commons, that metadata level, or metadata level has been taken care of. Uh, that being said, uh, if you're running an old computer, they don't have a plug-in for you, but, uh, or an old operating system. But, uh, you know, there are, there are ways to simplify this. Uh, and of course, you've got to, uh, you want to make something, something open, the key is to, uh, to use an open license and to, to mark your work. Um, so I, I just quickly here want to, uh, uh, at the end of the document, there are a number of references. Uh, if you're looking at, uh, at materials uh, for more, more information, the, uh, the OEC document uh, on giving knowledge for free is excellent. Uh, UNESCO and, and this Canadian group, Commonwealth of Learning, they've produced some uh, much more current guides uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of how to use OERs and how to find uh, OERs, and so I wanted to mention them. Uh, and there is a UNESCO Commonwealth of Learning Chair in Open Educational Resources at Athabas Athabasca University. Uh, I've got some more um, general OER sites uh, and a few more resources there as well. Uh, a couple more institutions again, uh, in the uh, largely in in, uh, in the U.S. And this very last slide. Uh, so I have included um, this last slide uh, as a way of saying, look, here I have used various material. Um, you know, so I've got you know, what it is, where it is, and the, uh, the license on it. And this was my first time trying to make an OER, and I have realized, as I've been thinking through this, that I've used things under a share-alike license, and I have not used the same licensing terms as those share-alike licensing. So I've got to go back and think. Uh, do I have to relicense my work? At the very beginning, I had a slide CC BY, and, uh, and if I'm using a share-alike license, I should be licensing my content. Or the, the, I've used this content, so the end product I, I create with it should have the same license. So I've got to go back and, uh, and fix my licensing. But it's 
it's a learning process for all involved. Um, but this is, this is essentially what you need to do uh, in terms of clearing rights. Uh, the flip side is to use someone's copyrighted material, you have to figure out who the copyright owner is, contact them, request a license. Uh, you then may have to pay, uh, or they may tell you they aren't going to license you, or they may um, uh, just not respond, or you may not even be able to locate them. Uh, so when you have copyrighted material, the work involved is, is huge, and it's all on you. When you have Creative Commons license material, this is what you need to do, is put up um, you know, a, a mark of attribution at the end. And the, the thing that, you know, this, I even caught myself here, uh, you need to make sure that you're following the licensing conditions. So I've got, uh, I've got, I've used these two attribution non-commercial share alike licenses. I now have to go back, re, and change the uh, the license for my own presentation to non or attribution non-commercial share alike because it's the only way I'm allowed to use that content. Uh, and lastly, this is my own. Uh, I, I'm going to. Now that I'm going to change the license, I'm going to add that I'm not responding to everyone's email as well. But uh, you know, solicit feedback. Uh, so, uh, so you know, there are. Uh, you know, this is. This was my first attempt at an OER, uh, creating one uh, and not just using one. So, uh, so it was a, a bit of a learning experience for me. Uh, and now I'll be happy to uh, to take any questions. Uh, First, and I do have uh, have one or two discussion questions. Although I know we're getting close to uh, to eleven thirty, so are there any questions? Yeah. I'm curious about how um, management systems like OTT or Safari kind of get into this. Like, do you think about having like a professor or anyone creating courses that are kind of behind this wall, and how they can actually that material? Yeah. The the common copyright answer is you have to read the license on. Uh, so I. I don't, off the top of my head, know what the WebCT license is. Yeah. So, you know, so you've yeah, if you've created a whole course, uh, you know, you've you've done ninety percent of the labor there. Um, of course, depending on what kind of content you used, if you've used a whole bunch of copyrighted material, which you can get away with in an educational institution on the physical campus of that, or physical uh, campus under the education exception, uh, you're, you're going to have a hard time making it open or unless you remove that content. Uh, in terms of, so you don't have a whole bunch of copyrighted material, you've used uh, Creative Commons licensed stuff or public domain stuff, uh, then it's simply a matter of, uh, unless there's some sort of licensing agreement between WebCT and, and the university where they've claimed some sort of ownership over your intellectual content, then it's simply a matter of you know, going through making those, uh, the, the declarations on any Creative, Com creative Commons content or other openly licensed content uh, and finding a place to put it. Um, so this is, this is where the institutional... Uh, uh, support would come in handy if the if Western said, you know, we're going to create an, an, an OCW portal and you can just put it all there. That would be much better. Uh, but if you've, you've created the content, you've put it all in, uh, in WebCT, uh, assuming the WebCT license allows you and you don't have a ton of copyrighted material, uh, you could go to OER Commons and start loading up your material that way. Uh, now, of course, on the, the other end, the searching user may say, oh, well, here's a lecture four by Michael McNally. I'm going to go to the MIT lecture instead because you're not going to have the, the brand recognition. Uh, but that's where, that's where some of the institutional issues come in. But you know, in terms of if you've done the work, you made a material for a student or for a class, you've done most of the work. Uh, it's really that last slide or two uh, in terms of, of making it something that you can put out there for everyone and, and finding a place for it. But OER Commons or Scholarship at Western is a, is a starting point. Yes?
matching the, the meeting with us. And here we are, all the people who really want to know what you have to say. And I have to say that it's really a job. I think very much it works in my classroom out of 300 we get at 20 who really want to be there. So here's the whole other logic that I have to put in place to make it happen in the classroom, which I would love to share with the world. But I take what everybody and everyone and spew other people's ideas and repurpose them and massage them and, you know, just uh, to, to have the content and have the delivery that fits <laughs> and sticks. Yeah. Now, I have no chance of putting my personal stuff this mm -hmm. way because uh, I would have to do half of it out, which would be or spend thousands of hours searching for all open materials to replace the copyrighted ones. This, this part of my job is 40% of my time. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, that part of the administrating is not an option. However, I think there are some good ideas that we can share in forms of survey. So we said we can just close the syllabus and go and learn from other people's syllabi. Very empowering, and I think this whole sharing idea is that there was enough money to engage those who don't have money to share their ideas with them. But my question for you is if I use a book and a good publisher allows me to use some of the slides and create the names of the questions that are very big to mix with the questions I create. Now, I have another set of rules that my publisher or book writer for a web into my lectures and consequently publish it out. Is there any rules regarding using textbooks that are copyrighted? Yes. If, if, I mean, if the there's a licensing agreement attached when you're using the, uh, the, the, the textbook. And that'll probably, my guess it would coming from a major publisher, spell out that it's for use in that class specifically, and, uh, and you're going to hit a wall there. Um, so you'd have to, um, you know, to, to work around that, you have to either cut out the textbook, or in the case of it was just the examination materials, uh, to kind of generate them all uh, from yourself, um, or from, or use other open educational resources. But, yeah, I mean, I, and I can sympathize uh, from, from FIM, so we have MIT, which is the undergraduate program, Media, Information, Technoculture. Yeah, you can't, I would have had 200 sleeping bodies in that presentation because there wasn't a video on the first slide. And, and you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, depending on your audience, uh, very hard to, uh, to, to adjust and cut things out, as where in, in the LIS side of things, like, would have been able, to, would have been fine with a presentation like that, where I can can use uh, Creative Commons materials. But you're right. The other, the syllabi, uh, depending on your examination materials, if it's coming out of the textbook, you could use those. Uh, so you can you can have parts of the the course that uh, that are open. Um, and on and and on the flip side is, you know, maybe to, and again depending on the subject matter, but maybe over time phase out the use of copyrighted materials and, and increase the use of OERs. Um, of course, depending on what you're teaching, that could be a more time than one has. But, uh, but it's something, yeah, something to think about is uh, you know, if, if you're perhaps not in a, in a course where you can, you can weigh more uh, OERs, don't have to have a ton of multimedia, to try and go all uh, open material and then yourself, you can open up your, uh, your course afterwards. Yes.
Yes. There's, so if you go back, um, looking at that, so starting at that 2007 OECD document, that was one of their big things. We have no data. We've done a little bit of studies. MIT has been really big on uh, collecting user data, uh, collecting surveys, and trying to figure out how people use their sites. So if you go, um, if you go to the MIT website, uh, I got to get back out of here. Um, and about, they have uh, statistics and stories, and they do a study every year on how how is our material being used, uh, how useful is it. Uh, so. 133 million visits, and they've started to drill down into uh, you know, percentage of use by educators, by students, uh, and and they have reports. So there is kind of that empirical evidence of how this is, is, is coming about. Uh, the other place to look is at the open universities, uh, and the biggest one is the open university out of the United Kingdom, where they're, they're trying to make a go of, of open education. Uh, so they have some some studies there about how how useful this is um, and how much people can learn uh, and, and and one of the things in the the, the literature uh, is uh, is you know sometimes some some people in in the academic world kind of hesitate with this idea of open education because they think wait a minute we all put our resources up there and then we allow anyone to go learn and we come up with this accreditation process doesn't that mean I'm going to be out of a job? Um, and the, the, the catch is there's always going to be a place for that in-person, face-to-face uh, educator. Uh, you, know, you can never, you, know, you can create the greatest OERs in the world. Uh, presumably your classroom is still a better environment. So, um, you know, it's, uh, we, we shouldn't worry that way. But there are, uh, MIT in particular has, uh, has some empirical uh, studies on their, their own portal's effectiveness. Yes. Uh, this type of information that's provided though doesn't really, doesn't really go to the heart of your question though in terms of how effective the teaching is using these materials. This says something about how common it's being used and where it's being used, but it doesn't really address that question. My guess is that it's really too early in this whole process. This whole movement hasn't happened long enough for you to look at how effective those materials are. Yes. Yes. Well, it's about eleven thirty, so. Yes, I think we're, we're unfortunately, well, unfortunately, because we told us uh, to capture the talk in a nice way, we uh, <laughs> the last hour and a half. So I, I want to thank you, Michael. I, I'm, I'm sure everyone in the room has had the same experience that I have of learning something new about open education resources, the benefits and the opportunities, and I see a really strong parallel with the development of, of, of yeah, populating the resource uh, repositories and so on with the open access publishing and the same sort of challenges about credibility, same challenges about buy-in. So it's, it's actually quite interesting to see there the teaching side of the house, what we've seen in the research uh, side of the, of the house. And certainly here at Western Libraries, we would involve with open source software. I, I, I reluctantly use Microsoft and Adobe, but I don't really want to, but the rest of the world doesn't want to talk to me unless I do. But, and then we also have been very big at, in terms of open access publishing and, and establishing our repository of scholarship Western, which is growing. And, and, and thank you so much for modeling the way in terms of depositing your, your presentation in scholarship at Western, and also creating and using open education resources so that we can see the opportunities, but also the the intricacies of the uh, application, particularly when it comes to interpretation of intellectual property, which is, you know, I have to say, it's quite fascinating to me, but I always think that, you know, you can't bring it up at cocktail parties. So this is the kind of room where you can talk about copyright and other forms of intellectual property and uh, people who are uh, engaged. I want to thank the organizers of today's event, Adrian Holm, Monica Bashkarsky, and Xi Jie. Pretty good? Oh, well, sorry. I need another trip to China to, to perfect that. But I especially wanted to thank you, Michael, for your wonderful presentation. As you said earlier, it was quite brilliantly presented. You must be a wonderful um, teacher in terms of the program, and people have a lot to learn from you in terms of the way you put things together, make it very clear, time management, excellent time management, etc. And so I learned a great deal, I think others did. And I'm in acknowledgement of what you contributed, I want to present you with this 
not a share of love, unfortunately. This bag of goodies uh, to take away is a thank you from uh, thank all of us for, for coming to speak during the Open Education Week, the first annual event. So thank you, Mike. Thank you.